everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Glad to have you back. We're here, you know, talking to dads, and we have a guest today, and I'm so excited. Uh, Carla's on today. We're going to be talking about uh, all the great things that she has to offer in, in communication and conversation around dads, relationships. There's so many great things. She has an awesome website. She's a great resource for you to draw from and to have in your corner. So, Carla, welcome to Dad Space. I'm so glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you for um, for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to what questions you've got um, for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm rubbing my hands together with eagerness. I'm excited to have you on the show. I'm always great to have people on that have a have a an expertise, a passion for something, because I think there's a the more voices we get to help men with men's mental health to help with relationships, to to help us to be better people, to have someone like you on the show that can give us some direction and guidance is great. So let's start off with A, where are you in this great big world of ours? So let's start with that. Um, so like physically, I'm in, um, the, yeah, I'm yeah. in the northwest of England in Europe, the UK. So um, yeah. <laughs> And it's winter here. And that's what I love about podcasting. Is it winter? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. it is. Because I don't know if you've got lis- listeners in the um, in the southern hemisphere. So, yeah, just for clarification, it's currently winter and wet and cold and everything that Britain is known for, we're experiencing in these few days. <laughs> nice. Yeah, Canada, we just lost all of our snow this week. It's above freezing. I'm thrilled because I don't have to shovel anything. So I'm... I'm so happy with that. But anyways, the world is different. Weather is crazy, but I'm glad to have you here. This is going to be really fun. Uh, We connected uh, around Dad Space to have you come on. And I would love for you to talk right at the beginning about your website, because I think it really narrows in on who you serve, what you talk about, how you help people. Kind of talk us through your website a little bit. Talk us through a little bit about What's on there? What are we going to find when we come to your website? Yeah, so um, I think the most sort of um, engaging part of my website is going to be the articles, podcasts, and, and um, videos that, uh, section that I have. So I'm generally talking both to men and women. So um, I work with both men, women, and also couples as well. And in all areas of sex, love, relationships. So, you know, wherever somebody is um, on their parenting journey, whether they plan to be a parent or already a parent, um, or, you know, children have already left home. Um, the resources are really, really varied. Um, I also support people that don't have children, but having children myself on my own journey, obviously quite often it's easy to be able to connect with people that have like a similar path to you uh, or have something in common. And so, um, you know, people that go on the website probably noticed that initially I start start off sort of a lot of my content was initially aimed at women. So I was supporting women who were mothers. That was my, um, how I sort of started my business and and my career. And then um, what I noticed was I was, as I was talking to mothers, also offering the perspective of, well, how do you think your husband or your partner might feel? So the father of your children. Um, And as I was engaging, especially in social media around that, what happened was I started noticing that um, men were showing an interest in the fact that, oh, he is a woman that's speaking and she actually understands me. So, you know, it's they're feeling less al- along the lines of it's them versus us. And I think quite often we can fall into that. You know, uh, both men and women can fall into the sort of like these different camps where we feel that we really, really need our voice to be heard. And But sometimes while we're doing that, we're not listening to the other And so um, because of that journey that I was going through and those men that were sort of engaging with my content and feeling seen and heard, um, I started having more men, um, fathers particularly, coming for um, support. And quite often it was a lot of them, they they had already been parents for a while and the relationship had got to a point where there was quite a lot of disconnection And so what I started noticing as I was, um, you know, working with these men and exploring and also like bringing awareness of how women spoke as well in Facebook groups and mothers groups and those sorts of things. I was noticing that 
um, a lot of men were feeling very, very disconnected in their role as a father. Um, and what was happening and, you know, what I came to realize as well in my own journey. So when I became pregnant, you know, then you know, through the birth and then those first few years, you know, when I reflected back, I looked and I thought I didn't really give the father of my children at the time too much um, opportunity to make a decision or decide, you know, which direction we should go when it comes to parenting. I sort of like just took on the role and and and, and went with it and, and didn't really give room for discussion. And, and I think that happens in a lot of relationships. Um, men just sort of almost let that happen. You do get some men that take interest and, and sort of it, it can become a battle. So I've got um, a couple starting with me this month. They are pregnant and there's very much um, um, like a disconnect over what they want when it comes to the birth. And it's so important that even though you might not necessarily want the same things that you're able to communicate and both people feel heard and their perspective feels seen. Um, and what I was noticing with, you know, the men that I was working with quite often, they weren't feeling that their views or thoughts were being heard. So in a way they just started to give up. And so noticing this sort of like pattern that I was seeing, I decided to use the term the forgotten father because even though, you know, as women, when we become mothers, there isn't the support in the Western world that we need from community. You know, we do take a lot of that responsibility. So, you know, especially if you're working, you know, you're working, then, you, you know, your your job load increases because you've got a baby to look after. And then, you know, you've got like night feeds. And, and so, you know, this role does sort of really become quite um, a mammoth task and the problem is if you haven't engaged your partner right from the beginning of the pregnancy and into the birth and they are watching from the outside that pattern has already been created that once you know the baby arrives there's already that disconnect and they don't or they don't feel a part of of the family and so a lot of men can feel very very isolated and feel like they're watching from the outside and what I started to notice speaking to women, but also speaking to men and how they were responding to that were three different types of behavior. So one of them was, um, you know, I need to be seen in any way possible. I need to get my partner's attention in any way. So even if it's a bad way, you know, they say like bad publicity is good publicity. So, you know, men, from their partner and what can happen is they end up like with passive aggressive comments you know um putting her down criticizing her choices and finding a way to start an argument um and that's not obviously the best way to treat especially a new mother or any human being but quite often the reason that what I found men were doing that is because they wanted the attention but they didn't know how to ask for it um, another way that some men were responding was by complete withdrawal. So they would work long hours. They would go out to family events and stay um, home or find something else to do. But they would be busy in a completely different way and start to disconnect and withdraw from, from the family. And then the third way that I saw men responding was by being overly nice. And so they started having it, um, stopped having any boundaries they began self-abandoning and would do anything to try and get their partner to be happy with them and, and please them. And, you know, I definitely saw quite a lot of men in that situation, you know, when their children were like teenagers, they felt that they had given everything that they possibly could to the relationship. But in the process, what they had done is that they had allowed their partners to, in a way, sort of like walk all over them and control the relationship. So what that meant was, you know, they had low self-esteem, low self-worth. They weren't being spoken to in the kindest of ways. Um, and they were feeling very, very lonely. You know, sex hadn't probably been there for a number of months, in some cases, a couple of years. Yes. Um, and, you know, when I asked them what their goals were around intimacy, you know, a lot of women have this idea that men are going to want like sex. It was like some of them just wanted to be able to cuddle their partner on the sofa. And that was like that would have been a massive thing for them to, to, to just have an experience that. So, 
so yeah so as I started like moving through and I, I began to see these um, patterns which is why you know when I start with um, the couple that I'll be working with this month who are pregnant you know it's very much going to be bringing in this idea of you know the woman's right on how she wants to use her body and birth is absolutely her right but also how can she give space for him his needs to be listened to and his concerns to be listened to you know um so it's very very delicate there's so much going on at play everybody wants to feel seen and heard um and it can lead to things like power struggles if people aren't willing to pause take a breath and just think what the other person might be experiencing and going through I love it. And I think when I was looking back when I was a young father, there was a, a lot of like finding my identity as a, as a dad. Um, little things like uh, my wife would go off and have these amazing um, baby showers and parties and gifts for the new baby. And it would be all of her and her friends. And as a dad, I'd be at home and there wasn't a lot going on. Uh, there was not a lot of guys getting together to celebrate, you know, my firstborn. And I, I would remember watching her leave and go to these great parties, feeling a little bit jealous that I couldn't go or I couldn't participate um, the way that she could. And in the moment, I was a little bit like, well, where's where, where do I get to celebrate? Where do I get to enjoy the excitement of having a new baby in the home? And then even to the other point is, when my children were small, I would take them out in public and go to a restaurant or a play date at the park. And people would come up to me that know us. And they would say little things like, oh, are you watching the children while your wife is at yeah. work? Today? And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Yeah. And would you ask my wife that if I wasn't here? Oh, are you watching your children while your husband's at work? No. Right. I'm parenting. I'm a dad. These are my children. I'm not a nanny. I'm not a, a babysitter. These are my I, I made these kids. This is these are my children. So um, I'm not watching them. It's not a job. It's who I am. And I'm like, why? Why is there that disconnect between how people view dads and how people view moms? Do you have any kind of insight? Because I really struggle with that as a young So man. I would say, going back to the first part where you were saying um, about not have, there not being parties and not, there not being, you know, sort of that role. I think that likely comes from the fact that um, if, if you think back to sort of 50, 60 years ago, men's purpose was really, really clear. So they had a very clear purpose of being a provider or they were likely going to be going to war. So those would tend to be the, 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 the two. Now, you know, we have a situation where women don't necessarily need, in inverted commas, a man because they can look after and pay for themselves. They can have bank accounts. And so there's a lot more autonomy. And yeah. so I think... What has happened for men is that sense of purpose that they once had, there's a little bit of a void there. And so some men obviously see and value fatherhood. They have, to a certain extent, a little bit more time because they're not the only ones making money. They generally will have a partner that's making money as well. And then you've also got the um, social conditioning that there is around, you know, what it means to be a man and again you know the inverted commas and you know there's this idea of like putting a man in a box of um you know what it takes to be a real man and you know 60 years ago real men weren't sort of um hanging out with their children taking them to the parks and you know so there's very much this sort of new identity of what it means to be a father. So the role of father like 60 years ago was very much being like the provider and the protector. But now, you know, um, as gender roles become more fluid and, you know, there's even a question whether there are actual um, gender roles and, and, and if they'll be completely, you know, eventually um, not even considered, so what you have is this idea that, you know, men have the opportunity now to be a lot more involved with their children. And 
I am seeing a shift that more men are looking for. So, you know, new fathers are looking for other men to connect with. So, you know, for example, I did a certification in sacred sexuality for men and my um, teacher from that certification, who's a man and a father, he has started up his own father's group because he understands the importance of men connecting man to man and being a new father himself. He has taken it upon himself to organize you know, a specific group for fathers. And I do know that these are starting, you know, gradually to pop up. And I think that's really important. So men get to share that experience and get to express what's happening because men are, are a lot more involved nowadays when it comes to bringing up children. You know, they spend more time with their children than maybe their own fathers did. You know, the, their own fathers were likely their disciplinarians. So, you know, it was very much a case of women would say, when your dad gets home, you know, he'll hear about this. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, so that was generally the threat. Um, and that's how, like, the father was seen, the father figure. And, you know, now in the home, you know, mo both the, the, the mother and the father tend to be um, the disciplinarian and, and the, those hats sort of like change from from one person to the next so the you know like I said the roles are a bit more fluid um and then with regards to the second part can you remind me again what that was yeah that was just the idea that I would be watching my children yeah you know, and, you know it's like come on so, and I think that goes back to, to the whole gender roles that I was um, referring to you know because we tend to see like women automatically as the one that should be taking on these roles and and I know for men, it's really frustrating to be seen as like a part time parent. And on the other side of it, you know, for women, it's very frustrating that, you know, if a child's misbehaving automatically, it's like, well, we look at the mother for that, you know. So I think there's like two sides to the coin. So in a way, we're both getting a raw deal, like nobody's living up. Mm -hmm. to the expectations or what we should or shouldn't be doing. And I think everyone's feeling, you know, as as things are shifting, you know, into a different way of being, there is a, for a lot of us like this discomfort around how we are perceived and our roles not being valued as well. Um, I was speaking to somebody recently, um, a mother on um, on a podcast and, you know, something that she, that she said that was really interesting. So she was telling me that, you know, she's a mum. And um, so um, she's in, in a couple with another woman and she's taken on the children of her partner, which come from a previous relationship. So they're, they're basically a lesbian couple. And she, as we were chatting and she was telling me about her role as, as, as a mum for, 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 for her children, after a, like a minute or two talking about that, she felt the need to explain, you know, but previously I used to work in, in finance. And so there's this idea that parenting isn't really something that has as much value in society as maybe like having an actual job. And so with that, with parenting not having that value, um, I think that that can create a lot of disconnect between men and women when they have those gender roles because it just means that men who may want to choose to stay at home and look after the children have this fear of not being seen as um, somebody who's really contributing to the family or contributing to society because I know that women feel that already and men are likely to feel it even more so because it's not within sort of like those gender social norms that we experience okay so one thing i'd love to talk to you about in the busyness of life where we have working parents we have kids in school we have after school activities trying to get dinner done busy 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 all the time work 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 go 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 all the time there's there's a gap that seems to widen between couples where their relationship, they don't have as much time for each other because they're busy. And silence creeps into the home where they don't talk as often. They don't sit on the couch and hold hands or go out and do things together like they did before they had children um, early in their relationship. And that silence can be so deafening and 
so crippling to a relationship because we're not talking, we're not communicating. What, from your perspective, can we do as couples for the men listening and the women listening to erase some of that silence that's happening in our home? How do we bring this back where we were in the early days of our relationships to benefit our family? What do we do? How do we get rid of that silence? Um, it's really interesting. I have um, have um, an article on my website, actually. And if I remember correctly, the title is something along the lines of things will get better when the kids grow up. So there's this idea that a lot of people have that, oh, it's just for this, for the moment. It's just right now that we're having this problem. But when the kids grow up, everything, we, when we've got time, we will be okay and and, and, and everything will work out. It's, ju- it's just right now. The thing is, as you said, you know, once you start that journey towards like disconnection, then then it's really difficult to get back even when the kids are no longer at home. You know, a relationship takes work and it takes, every relationship takes work, you know, whether it's a working relationship, so with your colleagues in your job or your career, um, with your family, you know, there is a certain amount of needing to spend time with each other to make it work. And, you know, people have asked me, you know, in my situation and in my life, like who is the priority in my life? And, the priority will change depending on who needs it most in that moment, you know, who's, whose need in, in that moment is most important. Sometimes that might be mine. So like if my cup needs filling up and I need time for self-care so that I can show up as the best parent and partner, then I might be the priority. Sometimes it will be my children. So I need to make sure, you know, if they're going through a difficult period, you know, they're struggling with something, I need to maybe let go of a few other things that are happening in my life to give my children priority. Um, I live with my children's father, but we're not in a relationship. So sometimes he, his needs may be more important. And the reason being is for him to show up as a father I need to make sure that he's also feeling supported and resourced to be able to be a good parent. And then I have my own partner who has his children. So, you know, sometimes when life is stressful for him, I might need to say to everybody, I just need to to focus on my partner. So, you know, this is, you know, we need to be aware of when we have children that we're showing our children that, you know, sometimes the priority is going to shift and that open communication with the children. I mean, if the babies, it's, it's a little bit different. Toddlers aren't going to understand as such, but there are other people in your life that you can ask for support so that you can, you know, let that young child be with somebody while you either support yourself or you work at that relationship with your partner. So taking time out to be just together without the children, I think is really, really important. And, you know, I I really really do notice now that I am no longer in relationship with my children's dad, how much more time I have for my new relationship, because we get to take it in turns. Who has the children each weekend? And sometimes I joke saying that, you know, we should not be in a relationship with the, you know, parent, the other parent of our children, <laughs> because it's it's so <laughs> difficult to, to to manage and 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 you know maintain that relationship. It does require um, a lot of work. And if you're waiting for the kids when they get older, what I'm actually seeing instead is that when those children start to hit teenage years, that's when the couples are sort of like. Okay, now that the children are older, actually, I don't think I want to be in this relationship anymore. And what I see in my practice and what I've seen in the statistics, like 60 percent of divorces are started by women. And so, you know, and and this is what also what I see in my practice, that women will generally be the ones that sort of start making the move away from the relationship. And. I think sometimes that can be because they have brought things to their partner on more than one occasion and he's not necessarily responded or um, compromised um, or, you know, listened to, to, to her perspective. It can also be that the way that the information is being brought and the communication itself isn't in 
the most caring and loving way. Um, because I know, you know, when I'm with a group of women, I can hear sometimes how they speak about their partners. And I think, gosh, if you speak about them now, then goodness knows how you're speaking to them, which is going to create that disconnect as well. Um, but yeah, this, this is sort of like a pattern that I notice for, for couples that aren't dedicating that time to each other. Um, and also around, you know, elements of intimacy, because I think for some pe- people, you know, sex can drop off. What I do notice is when women get to a certain age around their 40s and 50s, their desire for sex does pick up. And if their partner's not meeting them with that, then again, that can be sort of like cause for for women to think, is this the relationship that I want? So finding time to spend quality time together, just the two of you, and also making time for intimacy as well, I think is really important in, in maintaining that connection. You mentioned earlier about filling your own cup. But I think that sometimes people struggle with the idea that if I if I look inwardly and I focus on myself, I'm being selfish and I'm ignoring my responsibilities to my partner, to my children. Um, and it, I don't want to be seen as a selfish person. So in that moment, I'm not going to fill up my cup. I'm going to run on empty all the time. Just give, 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 give all the time. But I get burnt out. I get tired. I get exhausted. I lose my motivation. I lose my patience for people, my love for others, because I'm running resentment. Is it selfish? Is it selfish to fill your own cup? Um, I don't believe so, because like you said, if you're running on empty, you can't really give anything. And when I look at my own personal journey, and I've got an article on, um, on my website, and it's called Martyrdom in Motherhood. Okay. Um, And what I my personal journey was, you know, I thought I had to be the best mother, be, because I'd done like a lot of reading around attachment. I thought I had to be present for my children all the time. And I had to be there all the time. Um, But, you know, there is this idea of being a good enough parent, you know, because life itself, people aren't always going to show up for you 100% of the time. You know, there's an element of being attuned to the child's needs but not necessarily always needing to be physically present and right there and you know I had over attached my identity to being a mother and in the process completely lost who I was as a human being over gave and had a lot of resentment um because I wasn't looking after myself and just how I felt about myself my self-worth and my self-esteem really dropped as well so um yeah, so I would definitely say if anyone is feeling or experiencing resentment, to take a look at where they're not asking for needs to be met and also where they're not placing boundaries as well. Um, I tend to see this with mothers when it comes to the family. Um, and then when it comes to men, again, that third quality that I was talking about before of how men might respond if they're feeling isolated and on the outside of the relationship is by being overly nice and overly giving, you know, men being mindful that they're also not um, falling into that sort of like trap and that pattern of behavior as well. That's great. And I shared with you a little bit about my podcast ad space in that um, the podcast is designed for men. I'm, I wanted to address men's mental health, men showing up in their relationships, being better parents, um, and showing up in the world in a better better way. And that my podcast, even though it's directed towards men, 65% of my audience are female, which I find exciting and thrilling that they're finding value in the content, having great people like you on to share your thoughts and your expertise. I love that that my female audience is so big and enjoying it. This is great. So on behalf of the females that are listening to the podcast, they're listening on behalf of helping the, the, the men in their life, their husbands, their partners. I would love for you to kind of grab the microphone here and speak to the men that are listening what do we need to do as men in our homes to show up to be a better example to our partners, to our kids? What are you seeing with all of this great work you do with all the, the people you work with? Is there anything that we can learn and put into practice 
this week as men in our homes that make it better for everyone? What do we do? What's some of your ideas and tips that we can do right now? So I would say the first thing to do is to check in with your partner and see what um, what tasks could be divided a little bit more equally, even if the woman is at home. Um, you know, I don't I think it's really important for men to like spend a day or two, you know, if they're men that work to spend a day or two with their children by themselves completely. And what I mean is, you know, making the breakfast for them, finding the right clothes, making lunch, doing a little bit of housework just to understand how being in a house with children, you know, small children I'm referring to here, like how you can spend a whole day walking around being so, so busy and the house can look an absolute mess by the end of it. Like, <laughs> so, so, so just, just to do that, because I remember um, I, a few years ago um, when my children sort of were about two and five, six, something like that, my friends and I went to, um, went on a spa day for the day. And I left my kid's dad just literally like, don't be doing junk food because I cook all week. So there's no way that you have it off and be able to just go and buy them pizza, cook them a proper meal. That was my, and make sure they do something and that's it. I'm off out. What my friend did is she prepared the breakfast, got the clothes out, booked them activities, made sure the lunch was ready and packed, then had dinner already prepared that they just needed to turn the oven on and the time was written. And so literally the whole day had been sorted. So he thought that parenting was really easy because he didn't really get to fully experience the whole thing. And it was only when COVID happened and he was working from home, did he see actually what she was doing all day. So, um, so I would really invite men to spend a couple of days doing all of the house stuff as well as looking after the children and just to get an idea of what's involved and then turn around and say, you know, which tasks, they would probably, as men would feel more comfortable doing to take on. And also it's not just the physical ones. Um, You know, your listeners have probably heard quite a lot of like the mental load and the mental load is like needing to book a doctor's appointment, thinking of the school trip, making sure that this money's being paid, the car insurance being done and all of these different, you know, little jobs. Um, And just sitting down and writing a list of everything, you know, even down to like the front doormat, how often that gets washed or when the fridge gets pulled out and cleaned behind, you know, like all the sort of like small (laughs) things that as, as, as women sort of you have on the back of your mind, oh, when was the last time I did that, you know, and because that takes energy from you. And so writing everything down and just sort of like sitting down together and seeing how you can divide it up. One of the reasons being is, you know, when, um, and, and, and the reason that I share this is I remember having um, a, a client and he his child was about two years old. And he was saying to me, you know, the, the, there's no spontaneous sex anymore and I don't know where it's gone and all of these different things. And and I asked him how much he how much, you know, he, he contributed to the house. And he's like, well, I help out, you know, and I'm like, OK, first of all, help, you know, it's your house as well. Let's be mindful of the words that we're using here. Um, And then also, um, you know, I just made him aware, like if she's really, really tired, she's just not going to feel sexy and and want to like, you know, spontaneously initiate anything. She just, she just won't do it if she's just just tired. And, you know, so working together, one of the things that they ended up doing was readjusting the tasks and the mental load and and you know because she felt more supported then obviously her desire came back and she felt loved and cared for and you know that really helped and supported their relationship so you know I do really think that from the perspective of a woman that can be a, a, a massive help and support and if your partner is not supportive in how you do something. So say, for example, if you make a mistake or if you get something wrong and they don't say, they don't tell you in the, in the nicest way, 
place a boundary in how you will and won't be spoken to, you know, because I do know that some women can be, and because this was also me as well, um, can be really critical. Like I remember my children's dad um, when he decided to take on the load of the washing machine, you know, and, and that the washing was his job. He'd forget to put stuff in the washing machine so then we wouldn't have like clean clothes or he'd leave the washing in, in the washing machine and then 24 hours later it's still there and then it's stinking and you know initially I um, made remarks and comments which obviously weren't well received but then upon reflection in time I started to this was obviously before I had my training in in communication and, and coaching um so with time what I began to to realize was actually I don't need to tell him that, you know, when he opens a washing machine 24 hours later and he smells the clothes are stinky, I don't need to tell him (laughs) not to do that. Like he can figure that out for himself. So, you know, he learned a way of remembering to do that by setting an alarm on his phone (laughs) so that when the washing machine finished, you know, so he problem solved because he has that capacity. He's extremely gifted in the work that he does for his career. So there's every possibility that he's able to plan ahead Um, at home as well so I also had to like give some of the reins over and let him make mistakes you know and if there was something that I was really like not wanting him to make a mistake over like a favorite top that I was worried that could potentially get damaged in the washing machine then I kept that out of the way and I did it myself you know so um but everything else I thought well if it gets ruined you know, then he'll know that if he wants to save money, that the best thing is just to pay a bit more attention to the labels on on the clothes and and, and do it differently. And yeah, that, you know, the mistakes that he made were very little. And to be honest with you, I still make mistakes with the washing anyway now. So, you know, I'm I'm human. And I think sometimes we don't always give our partners the opportunity to to make mistakes and get it wrong. So, um, so yeah, so I would definitely say to the, to the men listening, to have boundaries around how you're spoken to, like welcome feedback, welcome um, suggestions. But at the same time, it needs to be delivered in a kind way. You know, you have a right to be spoken to with respect. Yeah. yeah. And that goes both yeah. ways, back and forth for in your relationship. Um, so the beauty of working with someone like you, coaching through relationships, I'm looking at your website while we're talking your website's Thank beautiful, you. by the way. Um, there's so much great information on there, articles that can help you. You can definitely fall in love with everything here on the page. Um, the bonus of working with someone like you is we talked about the silence that happens in a relationship at times. You come in and you start asking the questions that we're not asking in our relationship. And you start the conversation going so that we now have to answer the questions you're asking because... Now we need to come up with that answer. So tell me more about the benefits of working with a coach like you, because I want people to come and sign up to work with you and to be part of your community. What are some of the advantages of doing that? And how do you as a coach deal with one person or maybe two people who are not really sure they need any help or want your help? How do you break that that down? Because maybe I'm thinking about bringing my partner and that we're going to come and talk to you, but I already know that they're not going to be interested in working with someone to talk about our relationship. How is you? How do you as a coach break that down so that I can bring my partner with me and we're going to have a great relationship with you as our coach? So what I have noticed with the couples and men that I have worked with is that unfortunately some they, they may have had experiences previously with a counsellor or a therapist or another coach. Generally, a lot of couples coaches tend to be women. And the problem is some women haven't done their own sort of self-development work and around their own relationships to men and also around understanding men and their situation. As I said before, when I first started doing the work that I did, I was initially working with women, but speaking from the point of view of the man and explaining to the woman what how he might be feeling, and I started to get more men coming to my practice, I decided to do like a year to really understand men a lot deeper so that I could hold space a lot better. And so what can happen is, you know, 
because quite often it's women that are bringing their male partners. And what I I have seen is that a lot of men feel uncomfortable with that because their previous experience has been that they sit there and the, the woman therapist, coach, counselor takes the side of the woman and blames the man because, you know, from the outside, it looks like she's doing everything and he's not doing everything. But having done my own journey and my own self-development, I was the one in the relationship that started to make the changes that affected how my husband at the time and I managed everything and, and, and how we dealt with things. So what that means is that I only really need one person in the relationship to come to me, to be challenged, to be willing to put things into in, into practice, to be very self-responsible and making those changes in themselves and how they relate to their partner will affect the relationship automatically. If it's a couple coming to me, I ask exactly the same thing, to be self-responsible and to be aware of what's happening for each other. Because even though on the surface, what can o- it can often look like is that men are being lazy and not doing anything. They're not really like that, but they're just exhausted by the way that they're being spoken to, controlled, not given space, and they've shut down. And that's quite often what's happened. So, um, so when men are given the opportunity in that space to be able to feel seen and heard and be able to express themselves and encouraged to and given that space and that time, and then women actually begin to realize, oh, hang on a minute, he's not being lazy. You know, oh, yes, I hadn't really thought about that. You know, because one thing that I say to women is, would you speak to your friend the way that you speak to your partner? And most often mm. the answer is no. Right. Yeah. And I think the one thing I've heard somebody say too is, would you speak to yourself? uh, Would you speak to your children the way you talk to yourself? Right. And the way you, you know, so no, I would never talk to my children the way I talk to myself. Again, like you said, would you talk to your partner the way you talk to yourself? No. So there's that side of it. We really need to think about how we talk to ourselves in those moments when there's no one around how are, are we building ourselves up? Are we tearing ourselves down? Are we telling ourselves what we're doing well? Or are we focused on all the things that we're we're messing up in life? Right? I think we we as humans need to make sure that we're painting a good picture of ourselves, so we're in the right frame of mind to to be engaged in our relationships with our kids and with our partners. I think that's something we need to do is to make sure that we're filling our cup with the good things that we're doing as well and not just be so focused on all of our shortcomings because we know I can give you a list right now of everything I'm terrible at. Um, So we need to also then build ourselves up as well. So working with someone like you will definitely help to spark that conversation. Yeah, because one of the things that I, so when I start a session with, with anybody, so um, they, I always ask them for three celebrations of themselves. So since the last session you know what three celebrations do you have and it could be something as simple as like well I wanted to drink more water and I've been doing that you know um and then when I'm with the couples you know we start the session off by you celebrating something one thing about yourself one thing about your partner and one thing about your relationship and both people do that because it is like you say we do it's so easy to de- default into the negative and it's like Actually, how can we focus on the good things as well? Because when we look, they are there. And if we spend time, you know, feeling into that and being present with that, um, that helps build connection in the relationship. So, yeah, giving giving the good things the focus um, and just seeing the, the, the things that aren't working so well as opportunities to learn more about ourselves and our partners too. I think I could talk to you all day. This would be, I don't think we're allowed to do that because you have other things to do as well. But I just love listening to you and you got such great insights for couples. And I, I, I love that you're helping so many people in different relationships and, and things that are going on in their homes that you're there as a resource and a support for people. And I'm so glad that we connect around this around the podcast. Um, talk everybody through your website, Carla, a little bit more about we talk about the great um, articles you have on your site. What else can we find here? 
again and and promote the site. I love you to please. I want you to promote your what you do because you help so many people. Can you can you walk us yeah, through that? Yeah, so um so my website is carlacrivaro.com. So c r i v a r o.com. Um I have information. So like I have the homepage and different ways people can work with me. So like um, I can do individual coaching for men, individual coaching for women, and then um, couples coaching as well. Um, And I support around issues with sex. So, you know, that could be anything from like erectile dysfunction to um, delayed ejaculation, problems with um, orgasm, painful sex, issues around love so you know there may be some dads on here that are no longer in relationship and actually you know looking to find a new relationship and wanting to maybe change how they showed up in their last relationship so I support um, men and women around um, dating and also you know looking for love and not getting into old patterns of, of dating And then when it comes to relationships, quite often it tends to be around couples feeling disconnected, not being able to communicate effectively, getting trapped in things like blame cycles. So supporting them to have like more emotional and physical intimacy. Um, The sort of articles, videos and podcasts, lots of information there, like resources and tips on how to do things with regards to sex, love and relationships. But there's also, um, you know, I share a lot of my stuff as well and things that other that that my clients have experienced, because I think sometimes being able to hear other people's stories and knowing that somebody has had a similar experience to you can just feel really supportive. Um, I also have on there um, information around talks that I do. So I have done obviously things like podcast appearances, which are quite easy internationally um i also do um talks in person so i'm a co-creator of something that's called the sex lectures here in the uk um which takes um place every couple of months in manchester and we're hoping to start live streaming that as well so people even you know on the other side of the world will be able to buy a ticket and watch um people talking um and then i'm I'm looking to take my work into businesses as well. So there's a corporate element onto my website. Um, The reason being is um, I did an essay around sexual function and satisfaction and how it affects the work environment and work productivity. And so what I noticed was, yeah, what I noticed was that through my research, there were only a couple of studies that directly linked sexual satisfaction and function to work productivity in the work environment. But when you start putting the dots together, you know, there was research showing that sexual dissatisfaction caused problems in a relationship. Then there was other research showing that problems in a relationship affects mental health, causes anxiety, depression. Like one study here in the UK found that 60 percent of people that were depressed attributed problems to the relationship. So, you know, and then we know because there is such a push for well-being at the moment for a lot of businesses, we know that depression and anxiety affect work productivity and also, you know, how people collaborate in a work environment. So when you put those dots together, not having the sex life and the relationship life that you want will impact how you can show up at work. And so the work that I want to bring to businesses is around healthy communication, healthy relationships, understanding men, masculinity in the glass ceiling, looking at discrimination, judgments, prejudice, and exploring shadow work. So those are like our unconscious biases that we're not always aware of. Things around boundaries and consent, because, you know, as we were talking before, a lot of people really struggle to say no and look after themselves. Um, So that's the work that I'm looking to take um, into businesses with talk workshops and retreats as well wow (laughs) how do you have time for anything else with all that (laughs) list my goodness it's amazing it's amazing um carla it's so great to have you on dad space i would love to have you come back in the future and talk more we just we've only touched a small amount of what you have as resources and who you are and what you offer So I'll leave the door open. I would love to have you come back in the future and and let's pick up on our conversation and and help more couples, 
help more relationships in through conversation, I think that's a, that'd be a, a great value for anybody listening to the podcast. So again, thank you so much for doing this, Carla. I really love having thank you. Thank you so much for having me, David. It's been really great to chat. Thank you. Excellent, everyone. Please go support Carla. Uh, links on in the show notes. Make sure you go over and check out. She's links as well to her LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. Go over and follow and, and give all the love to, to Carla and all the things she does. Carla, again, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, thanks for listening to Dad Space today. I'm so thankful that you were here for this episode. If uh, you like the show, please let another dad know. Hey, <laughs> that kind of rhymed. Anyways, uh, share the episode out with somebody in your circle who would love Dad Space. That means so much to us here for our guests who donate their time to be on the show. And we just want to see this grow. So, again, another rhyme. Oh, wow. Anyhow, <laughs> um, I think I need to write a song or something. Thank you for being here for with Dad Space. And again, looking forward to the next episode. Look forward to having you here again with us. And if we can help you in any way, if you have a great guest idea for the show, a topic that we you would love us to cover, we would love to do that here on Dad Space. So thanks for listening and thanks for being part of the community. And to you, Dad, thank you for listening and thank you for sharing Dad Space. Catch you on the next one. Take care.